Car Audio is an intimidating arena for newbies to enter. Have you ever wondered what's the best way to match your subs and your amplifiers? And have you spent countless hours reading blog posts trying to figure out your system? I get asked about it every single day. Hey James, what's a good amp for this sub? What's a good subwoofer for this amp? Can I use two subwoofers for this amp? Do I need an amp for each subwoofer? Does this amp have enough power for this sub? Is this too powerful for that? Why are you always yelling? But there's no better feeling than building your own system the way you want it. This is going to be fairly technical, so pay attention, take notes, do whatever you gotta do. Hey James, why are you wearing a cardigan? Because I'm a professor and you're gonna learn today. I got time today. When matching subwoofers and amplifiers, there are four main points to consider. First, the rated RMS power input of the subwoofer or subwoofers. Second, the final impedance, resistance in ohms of a single sub or multiple subs wired together at the amplifier. Third, the type of amplifier you are using, monoblock, two channel, etc. And the fourth is the type of enclosure for your system. RMS ratings are the measure of continuous power that the subwoofer can accept. You may see it sometimes listed as thermal power handling. RMS power is code for the maximum amount of power in watts that the speaker or subwoofer can dissipate as heat and sound without damaging the voice coil. Plenty of manufacturers overrate their max power input and broadcast it everywhere, but it's much more accurate to use the RMS rating to determine the right amplifier. And although max power is a sexy number, it really only represents quick bursts of power, not sustained power. For example, the DB Drive K912D4 is a powerful 4 ohm subwoofer and has a max power output of 2000 watts. Woo! But realistically, that is only sustainable for one or two seconds. If you look at its RMS input rating, you'll see it's 1000 watts, which is a much more accurate display of its power. Manufacturers throw the max in your face, just try to ignore it. For your system, you'll want to match the RMS input rating of the subwoofer or subwoofers to that of the RMS amplifier output that you have chosen. You'll also need to make sure that your amplifier will output this at the impedance that you have wired your subwoofers at. When dealing with multiple subwoofers, combine the RMS input rating of them. Two 350 watt 10 inch subwoofers will need 700 watts combined. A rule of thumb that we use is to overrate your amplifier by about 10 to 20%. It's okay to run a little bit more or a little bit less power, but there are trade-offs to each. An easy way to match a subwoofer with an amp is to use a little math. Multiply the sub's rating by 120% and 90% to get the power range of the amp that is needed. Two 350 watt RMS subs together need a total of 700 watts RMS. An amp putting out between 630 watts to 840 watts RMS will do. Now let's talk about those trade-offs. A slightly underpowered amp when nearing its maximum output will begin to output excessive distortion. This distortion causes a large increase in heat at the voice coil, eventually causing damage. So if you are underpowering your enclosure, understand what distortion sounds like and back the volume down when you hear it to prevent speaker damage. The reason we recommend a more powerful amp is for headroom. Having a slightly overpowered amp also allows the amp to run cooler and with more reserved power. And as we stated, heat is a killer. Sustained periods of input power exceeding the thermal limit of the subwoofer will cause the voice coil to fail. You still with me? If not, rewind and watch again. I don't have time to go over this more than once. Just pay attention. Jesus Christ. Now let's move on to impedance. Impedance is the electrical characteristic of a speaker that restricts or impedes the flow of current and is measured in ohms. If you have no idea what the f I just said, don't worry, just pay attention to the numbers. It will become clear in a minute. The problem most people have with subwoofer and speaker impedances is how to combine them when using more than one driver or if the driver is equipped with dual voice coils. The impedance directly affects the load of the amplifier, not the power requirement of the driver. Amplifiers have output ratings. Those ratings will show different power outputs at different output loads. Let's say we have an amplifier with a max rating of 300 watts at one channel at 4 ohms and 700 watts by one channel at 2 ohms. This means the largest load you can place on the amp is 2 ohms. So wiring your subwoofers to 1 ohm will either cause the amp to immediately go into protect mode or will cause the amp to get excessively hot and cook itself. Larger resistance in ohms equals a smaller load at the amplifier or less heat generated by the amp. The trade-off of the smaller load is less power output from the amp. 
For example, an amplifier will usually double its output at 2 ohms compared to 4 ohms, but the amp will run much harder as it's being asked to work harder. So why not just wire my subs to 1 ohm then and get insane bass? Well, if this amp was rated for 1 ohm loads, we would do exactly that, but it's not. Depending on the amount of subs and how you wire them, you'll need to match the final wired impedance of the subs to that of the power output rating of the amp at your wired impedance. For example, the Kicker CXA 1200.1 monoblock amplifier has an RMS rating of 1200 watts at 2 ohms and 600 watts at 4 ohms. When combining more than one subwoofer, you'll need to figure out their impedance wired in series or parallel to match your amp. In this example, let's use two 2 ohm single voice coil subwoofers with an RMS of 500 watts each. Wiring these in parallel will give you a 1 ohm load. Wired in series, they'll give you a 4 ohm load. So based on this, we know that this amplifier wouldn't be the greatest match for the 500 watt subwoofers. We need 1000 watts. Now, what subs should you get instead? Y'all took calculus, right? We'll take 1200 watts times 0.9 or 90% for the base of the headroom. This leaves us with 1080 watts. So if we purchased two subwoofers that had a rating of 450 to 500 watts each and were single voice coil 4 ohm, not 2 ohm, wired in parallel, they would match perfectly to our amp. But what if the subwoofers you want are only offered in dual voice coil? How do you figure out what subwoofers you need? Dual 2 ohm or dual 4 ohm? Two dual voice coil 2 ohm subwoofers can be set up to have each of their voice coils wired in series, making each woofer 4 ohms. Then each woofer can be paralleled, equaling a 2 ohm load. They can also be wired in a 4 way parallel for a half ohm load. Okay, you still with me? Good. If not, I don't care. I'm moving on. What do you want me to do? Come hold your hand and walk you through it with drawings? Now, how do you select an amplifier? Amps range from one channel monoblocks all the way up to five and six channels. A monoblock is generally the best option when powering multiple subwoofers. They're designed to output tons of power at low impedances. A two or four channel amp can also be used, but they are usually limited in their power output and their impedance capabilities. By bridging channels, you effectively combine the output of two channels. So a four channel becomes a two channel and a two channel becomes a mono amp. But yet again, there are trade-offs. Most two and four channel amps in bridged mode cannot accept a load lower than four ohms. Some full range class D amps allow for lower loads, but class ABs are the most common. The reason for this is, in bridged mode, each output channel of the amplifier is seeing half the load. So with a four ohm load, half of the bridged amplifier is seeing two ohms. A monoblock can push any number of subs, as long as the minimum impedance is not exceeded and the output power matches up to the subwoofers or speakers you are powering. For example, you can wire three 2 ohm dual voice coil subwoofers to a final impedance of 1.34 ohms or 3 ohms. Then you just calculate the RMS input power required for the subs, all added together to match the output of the amplifier. When trying to make a buying decision, choose an amplifier that is CEA 2006 compliant. This certifies that your amplifier's power output ratings are real power numbers, not inflated marketing ratings. Let's do something fun. Let's build a system from scratch. Remember, you want to match the RMS and impedance. We'll start with one of my favorite amps, Rockford Fosgate's P1000X1BD monoblock, which will output 1000 watts RMS at 1 ohm. 600 watts RMS at 2 ohms and 300 watts at 4 ohms. So what size woofers do we want? Do we want some 15s, some 12s, or some 10s? How about we get crazy and do 4 12s? Our amplifier can output 1000 watts RMS at 1 ohm. This means we want to look for 250 watt RMS subwoofers. In this system, we will use the P1S412s. We'll wire these in parallel, giving our amplifier a 1 ohm load for our 1000 watt output. Boom, perfect match. These are a match made in car audio heaven. What about if you want three subs with this amp? The Rockford P2 10 inch subwoofer is a 300 watt RMS subwoofer. So three of these will need 900 watts RMS, but do we need the dual two ohm or the dual four ohm? We want our amplifier to run at one ohm because at that load, the amp will put out 1000 watts. Which one of these will get us the one ohm load? If we choose the dual 4 ohm model, the P2D410, we can only load the amplifier at 6 ohms 
or 2.67 ohms, and that isn't going to work. If we choose the P2D210s, we can load the amp at 1.34 ohms or 3 ohms. Again, a perfect match with the P1000X1BD. See guys, this isn't that hard. So how do you know what kind of system is right for you? The sub and amp you need depends on what you listen to and the amount of bass you want. It's all personal preference, there are no rules. If you plan on listening to music at moderate volume levels or have a smaller car, a subwoofer with a lower power handling, say 100 to 250 watts, and a matching amp is a good combo. Subwoofer enclosures also play a huge part in the amount of output a system will have. There's some other important things to keep in mind, like ported enclosures require subsonic filters, and sealed enclosures benefit from more robust amps, but we will leave all of that for another video. Let's go over some more common questions I get almost every day. Do I need to get a new car battery if I get a powerful amp? Generally, no, but this depends on the input current requirements of the amp or amps you choose and if you play on max volume levels all the time. If your charging system has an alternator that is only 80 amps and you went crazy and have two 10,000 watt model blocks that require 300 amps of input current each, you will need multiple new batteries, new high current alternator, and many other upgrades. You can run multiple amps and be fine with the battery and charging system you have. It all comes down to power requirements and output capability of your charging system. All right, another one. I have two subs. Do I need two amps to power them? No, not necessarily. You can choose to run two amps if your wallet lets you, but you can also choose any amp you want as long as you load it properly. In addition to loading an amplifier, tuning your system right is very important. Crossovers, subsonic filters, input gain all play an important role in what your system will sound like. Make sure to check out our video on setting input gain. Okay, whose brain is fried besides mine? If anyone has any questions or comments or needs a suggestion of gear, whatever, just leave anything below. Hopefully this helped. Let us know what you think. Check out qualitymobilevideo.com for all of your car audio gear. Subscribe to our channel and thanks for watching. Class dismissed.